The following presentation is not suitable for young children. Listener discretion is advised. What do you mean Ginrin Kawaku isn't available? It's listed right there on your website. It was a drizzly July day in 2017 in the Tui Watana neighborhood of Bangkok. It's a mostly middle class suburb, but it's also home to a few upscale gated homes. In one of those, Quebec native Alexandra Cazes was about to rip his koi fish dealer a new one. Well, unfortunately, someone just bought her. We have a wide variety of other fish available if you'd like. No, I don't want Sanki or Showa or Ochiba. Alexandra interrupted. I want Kowaku, and I want the one with the silver scales. It's the freaking king of koi. Uh, I apologize, sir, but we won't be getting another Ginrin Kowaku until the fall harvest season. Well, maybe I'll just go to Japan and get one myself. Alexandra hung up. The koi pond was proving to be yet another headache in a project full of them. Alexandra was currently building a house 20 minutes away from this one. It would be the fourth house the Canadian would own in his adopted home of Thailand. He also had a villa in Cyprus and another in Antigua and Barbuda. This home would be the most expensive yet, worth $7.6 million in fact. Not that Alexandra couldn't afford it. The 26-year-old was worth a cool $23 million and he loved to flaunt his wealth. He had expensive taste in cars, clothes, and travel. He knew that once his palatial mansion was finished, all the hassles would be worth it. What the fuck was that? Alexandra looked out the window. Some dipshit had just crashed his car into the front gate. Huh, perfect. As if he didn't have enough on his plate already. Without even putting on a shirt, Alexandra raced outside to sort things out. Outside, neighbors had come out of their homes to watch the car's three occupants who were having a heated argument. How do you not even know how to make a three-point turn? One of them shouted. That's like the first thing they teach you in driver's school. Alexandra stormed out. What the hell is going on here? He demanded. I'm going to need to see your insurance information. Sure thing, Mr. Kazez, the driver replied. Wait a minute. How the hell did they know his name? Suddenly, a van pulled into the driveway. The door opened and federal agents in raid jackets streamed out. Oh, fuck. Alexandra ran for it, making a beeline for a field where he'd recently photographed a three-foot-long monitor lizard. The feds nabbed him and put him into the van. More of them went inside to search the house. Alexandra's neighbors were shocked. Alexandra and his wife had mostly kept to themselves, but all that money definitely attracted attention. His neighbors thought he worked for the hotel industry. They had no idea that Alexandra was actually the mastermind behind Alpha Bay, one of the biggest online marketplaces on the dark web. In fact, he left his unencrypted laptop logged into his admin account, which the feds discovered shortly after busting him. It wasn't the first of Alexandra's security lapses either. Alexandra's arrest was definitely a coup for law enforcement, but it was just the beginning. Alexandra was just one of the first dominoes to fall in what would become the biggest dark web bust of all time. On this episode, the eBay of drugs, multinational sting operations, and the origins of the dark web. I'm Keith Kornaluk, and this is Moda Mischief. You're listening to Moda Mischief. In this series, we explore the darkest reaches of the internet. We'll take you into the minds of the world's most notorious hackers and the lives affected by them. We'll also show you places you won't find on Google and what goes on down there. This is the story of the dark web and Operation Bayonet. Hey guys, I'd like to take a moment to let you all know about a great podcast I found. It's called The Unethical Podcast, and it has a hilarious team of hosts that tell a different, controversial story each week and a lot of these cases you've never heard of before. Look, true crime can be hard to take in, but these guys make you feel like you're having a conversation with your friends around a coffee table or over beers. And the best thing about it is that if you want to, you can actually have a conversation with them. They bring listeners on the show as guest hosts all the time, and the points of view are always refreshing. This podcast is blowing up, so give it a chance. It won't be long until you're laughing, gasping, and crying along with them. And you may even soil yourself. 
You can find Unethical Podcasts wherever you get your podcasts, or click the link in the show notes. A year or two before his arrest, Alexandra pulled into his driveway in a brand new Porsche Panamera. The sleek black luxury vehicle retails for almost 90 grand, with upscale versions costing double that. He went inside and logged into the forums for Rouge V. If you're not familiar with Rouge V, congratulations. Rouge V's real name is Darouche Villazida, and he's a blogger, a pickup artist, and a proud member of the alt-right Manosphere. He's most famous for his Bang series of books, where he explains how to pick up women from different countries, anywhere from Brazil to Iceland. On the forums, Alexandra went by the username Romeo, as in Romeo but with raw instead of ro, and he averaged more than a post per day. One of his most popular posts was a thread prompting users to name, quote, the most beta thing they'd ever done. Another was a 7,500-word opus describing how he kept girls on the side and monitored his wife's weight. But today, the only thing on his mind was the car. He began to type, Just got my new wheels. Tricked out Panamera with all the specs. Thai girls love supercars. Bullshit. Someone replied, the only thing sadder than owning a Porsche is lying about owning a Porsche. Alexandra was pissed. They wanted proof? Huh, he'll show them. He went back outside, hopped in the car, and filmed himself driving around the block. When he pulled back into the driveway, he flipped off the camera. Inside, he uploaded the video to the forums. Yeah, that'll show him. Finally, a few new forum users typed in, Nice wheels, or congratulations. One of them was still skeptical. They wanted to know how he paid for all the luxury cars and homes he loved to flex about. He told them he'd earned everything from smart investments in cryptocurrency, but they weren't buying it. Alexandra smirked. We all have our business, he typed back. Let's leave it at that. Alexandra was born in 1991 in Quebec. He was a brilliant kid with an IQ of 142, and he skipped a grade in school. He excelled at computer programming, and by 14, he was a hacker. Alexandra didn't party. According to his parents, he never even smoked a cigarette and harped on his father to kick the habit. Otherwise, Alexandra was what you might call morally flexible. He loved money and was obsessed with making it. A friend would later say that he always figured Alexandra would cook up some sort of scam. His time on the Rouge V forums radicalized him too. In another Rouge V post, he complained that Quebec was overrun with welfare moochers and Muslim refugees, who he said, quote, bred like bedbugs. He wanted a more traditional society and a traditional wife. In 2008, an 18-year-old Alexandra visited Thailand and fell in love with the country. And in 2012, he moved there. He met a woman named Sunisa on a matchmaking site and married her. For work, Alexandra did software development, at least officially. He set up a company called EBX Technologies, which he claimed was a web developer that helped small businesses set up websites. But the dark web and the potential for riches was just too much to resist. The dark web is a small fraction of the deep web, a term for all the places on the internet that aren't accessible by search engines like Google. This is mostly benign content, like your Netflix user account or password-protected email accounts. The dark web refers to the few thousand websites that use encryption software, including browsers like Tor, I2P, and Freenet to mask their IP addresses. There's always been a demand for the ability to use the internet anonymously. Versions of the dark web have always existed. The modern internet traces its origins to ARPANET, a system that was created in 1969 that allowed computers to communicate over phone lines. Almost immediately, ARPANET users were creating unlisted pages on their servers. In 1971 or 1972, before Ross Albrecht and Alexandra Cazes were even born, students at Stanford used ARPANET to score weed from students at MIT. Yes, that's correct. The first online transaction was a drug deal. The modern dark web began with the introduction of anonymous browsers. The most well-known of these is the Tor browser. Research on the Tor browser began in the late 1990s as a joint project between the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory and the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, the Pentagon's Research and Development Division. 
Tor browsers mask their users' identities by sending their IP requests through several random servers all over the world. It's called onion routing. Tor actually stands for the onion router, and Tor web pages all end with a .onion suffix. There are several reasons why government and law enforcement needed a way to browse the web anonymously. Undercover cops and spies could use it to report to their superiors without being detected. Dissidents in authoritarian countries could use Tor to access the web without fear of retribution. But most of all, Tor browsers would allow law enforcement to monitor illegal activity without a government IP address showing up on a site's servers. The Tor network was released in 2002, and its code was made available with a free open software license. It receives funding from a variety of organizations, including DARPA. The Tor browser makes it even easier to set up a website and start doing business. Soon, the government's anonymous web browser had become a haven for human traffickers, child pornographers, and terrorists. In 2015, Interpol began investigating a dark web human trafficking organization called the Black Death Group. Two years later, a Black Death member named Lukas Powell Erba was arrested for kidnapping a British model who he intended to put up for auction. Besides anonymous web browsers and PGP encryption, the other innovation that needed to happen in order for sites like Alphabay to exist was the creation of an untraceable digital currency. When Satoshi Nakamoto mined the first Bitcoin in 2009, it gave drug traffickers a way to do business that couldn't be traced. Or so they thought. Just two years after Bitcoin was created, Ross Albrecht started the Silk Road. And we covered the rise and fall of the dark web's first drug marketplace in our first two-part first episode, which is available right now wherever you get your podcasts. When the Silk Road was shut down in 2013, it was just a temporary setback for the online drug and contraband industry. Almost immediately, several other dark web marketplaces popped up in its place with names like Silk Road 2.0, founded by former Silk Road staffers, Sheep Marketplace, and Black Market Reloaded. All of these sites differed from the Silk Road in one major way. For Silk Road's founder Ross Albrecht, a devoted libertarian, making money wasn't the only goal. He also wanted to create a community of people with shared political beliefs. But the dark market drug website admins who came after Albrecht didn't have such lofty ideals. For them, it was all about money. Sometimes they even stole directly from their users. In Sheep Marketplace's case, the site was shut down in late 2013 after a vendor allegedly stole $6 million in Bitcoin from an escrow account. Alexandra and Alphabay admins would face similar allegations during the site's lifespan. All in all, the dark web was the perfect place for someone who wanted to make a fortune and didn't care how they did it. Alexandra Cazes founded Alphabay in 2014. For him, selling drugs was simply a means to an end. Alexandra was more ambitious than most of the other rip-and-run marketplaces that took the Silk Road's place. For starters, Alphabay offered more goods and services. In addition to drugs, users could buy stolen credit card numbers, fake IDs, guns, and even online fraud tutorials. That's right, you could buy a step-by-step -step instruction manual and everything from how to fish other people's email accounts to stealing their banking information. Alphabay did ban two things, however, child pornography and hitmen services. Those would attract too much heat. If Silk Road was the Amazon.com of drugs, Alexandra wanted Alphabay to become the dark web eBay. On Alphabay, users could place bids on what they wanted to buy. Also like eBay, vendors had pages that displayed ratings. The more transactions they completed, the better their reputation. All of this made Alphabay stand out in the post-Silk Road chaos. Within 90 days of its launch, Alphabay had 14,000 new users. But not everything was going smoothly. All of the work fell on Alexandra. A lot was on his plate. First, there was the issue of website security. As the administrator of a dark web marketplace, Alexandra had to worry about law enforcement. But he also had to stay one step ahead of the hackers and scammers who frequented the site. When he wasn't overseeing its security, he was doing all the programming, promotion on Reddit and other forums, and resolving disputes between vendors and buyers. 
Just like eBay, sometimes packages got lost in the mail. It was all so much that he barely had any time to enjoy his cars, villas, and mistresses. On Alpha Bay, Alexandra went by the handle Alpha02. In the fall of 2014, he logged into his account and felt his blood run cold. Someone had popped the shell by hacking the site and running their own commands on his server. What the hell? Was someone just fucking with him? Did they want ransom? Or was it a cop? One thing was certain. Alexandra had to act fast to plug the leak and find the SOB who had caused it. As Alexandra started studying the server logs, a message appeared in his inbox from a user named DSnake. It was an Alpha Bay user who'd been active on the carding forums where people exchanged tools to commit credit card fraud. Before Alpha Bay, DSnake was an active member of the credit card fraud community on sites like Evolution and Tor Carter as early as 2013. He'd eventually ascended the ranks and become a market administrator himself. Alexandra had no idea who D Snake really was or if he could trust him. He did find out what he wanted, though a job. Alexandra had no choice. He brought D Snake on board as Alpha Bay security administrator. D Snake could hack, and he had experience running a website. And now, Alexandra had someone to share the workload. Over time, Alexandra and D Snake put the awkwardness of their initial meeting behind them. It certainly helped that Alpha Bay continued to grow and grow. A year after launch, it was the biggest drug site on the dark web. By 2016, it was 10 times bigger than the Silk Road ever was. It grew to accept other cryptocurrencies like Ethereum and Monero. By 2017, the site had 400,000 active users generating between $600,000 and $800,000 in transactions per day. Alexandra earned a commission of 2 to 4% on each transaction, adding up to tens of millions of dollars. But even with his new head of security, Alpha Bay continued to be vulnerable to breaches. In 2016, Alexandra launched a feature that allowed Alpha Bay users to access their profile without having to log into the site, so they could look at their messages, check their balance, withdraw funds, and view their past transactions. A Redditor noticed that by changing the message ID, you could access anyone's private messages. For a site based on anonymity, the consequences could be devastating. Fortunately, only a tiny fraction of messages over a year old had been accessed. Alexandra rewarded the Redditor and closed the exploit. A year later, a hacker named Cypher0007 discovered another security flaw that allowed him to steal 218,000 private messages, which included buyers' and sellers' first and last names, nicknames, addresses, and tracking numbers for shipments. Alexandra was forced to pay off Cypher0007 to get him to share his methods. Alexandra's dreams of founding his own Thai digital drug kingdom were becoming a reality. But all of these security breaches had ominous implications for Alpha Bay's future. And now, law enforcement was starting to take notice. When it came to fighting crime on the dark web, the FBI had come a long way in a short time. The first official FBI investigation into a dark web marketplace, Operation Onion Peeler, began in 2013 and resulted in the Silk Road takedown. If Onion Peeler taught them one thing, it was how outdated their policing methods were. Law enforcement was learning that cooperation was more important than ever. Dark web trafficking was an inherently international affair. A site like the Silk Road might have servers in one country, the dealer in another, and the buyer in a third altogether. Typical dick measuring contests just weren't an option. The FBI was also learning that traditional war on drugs techniques were obsolete. Going after the small fish like dealers and buyers, flipping them, and using them to catch the big fish wasn't going to cut it. On the dark web, buyers and dealers were almost always anonymous to each other. Instead of targeting small timers, law enforcement would have to go after the kingpins. Obviously, the fact that everyone was using Tor browsers and PGP encryption made it extremely difficult to identify them. Often, the best way to nail a dark web kingpin was the same technique used by law enforcement for centuries. Wait until they made a mistake. By 2016, the FBI was well aware of Alpha Bay and its activities. 
The online drug trade hadn't slowed down after the Silk Road like the FBI had hoped. Worse, America was in the throes of the opioid epidemic. Sites like Alphabay were becoming a bigger and bigger part of the supply, especially the synthetic opioid supply. There were dozens of opioid dealers operating on Alphabay, with 21,000 listings. In 2017, authorities arrested a six-person group of dealers who were purchasing fentanyl from China, pressing it into pills, and selling it on the dark web. They'd sold hundreds of thousands of those pills. Alphabay had already been linked to several overdoses in America. Users on its own message boards described ODing in detail. In one gruesome episode, two 13-year-old best friends in Park City, Utah, obtained a small amount of a synthetic opioid called Pink, or U47700. They got it from one of their older sisters who ordered it on Alphabay. The middle schoolers overdosed and died two days apart from each other. The pressure to shut down the Alphabay was mounting. The FBI's Sacramento field office was heading the Alphabay investigation, which it was calling Operation Bayonet. Special Agent Nicholas Ferripides was in charge. He was proud of the name Operation Bayonet, which he came up with all by himself. Not only did it sound badass, it was also a pun on multiple levels. Bay for Alpha Bay and Net for the Internet. Best of all, it wasn't taken. Pheripides went undercover on Alpha Bay. He'd hoped to make a few purchases and nab some well-respected drug dealers in the community. He created a username and signed up for an account. He got a ping from his email box. It was the typical welcome to the site message, like you'd get when you'd sign up for a website. But when Pheripides opened it, he couldn't believe his eyes. It was sent from a regular Hotmail address. And there it was, pimpalex91 at hotmail.com. No way. Whoever sent that email wasn't actually using their real email address, were they? Surely this was some low-level employee who fucked up royally. Pheripides did some digging and discovered that the Hotmail address was connected to a LinkedIn account and a PayPal account for the owner of a Canadian company called EBX Technologies. A little more digging uncovered a name, Alexandra Cazes. Pheripides and the team then discovered a forum post Alexandra had written in a tech blog in 2008, in which he gave advice about removing a virus from a digital photograph. The post contained the Pimp Alex 91 hotmail address. It was also made with the username Alpha02, the same one Alexandra was using on Alphabay. After learning Alexandra was living in Thailand most of the time, law enforcement began cooperating with the Royal Thai Police. Further monitoring led investigators to Alexandra's Bitcoin wallet. There, they were able to match transactions to the ones he made on Alphabay. By the summer of 2017, Pheripides and his team had everything they needed to indict Alexandra. But first, in the spirit of cooperation, they passed along news of their impending bust to another investigation in the Netherlands. Operation Bayonet was about to get bigger. In Europe, most countries have dedicated cybercrime fighting units. Many of them are coordinated by Europol, the EU's top law enforcement body. In the Netherlands, dark web drug trafficking and other cybercrime is fought by the National High Tech Crime Unit. By the time the tip of Alexandra's arrest and the impending Alpha Bay shutdown reached the NHTCU, the NHTCU was already almost 10 months deep into an investigation of another dark web marketplace, Hansa. Hansa was the second biggest after Alpha Bay. It was founded in Germany in August of 2015, one of the many dark web marketplaces that tried to fill the void left by the Silk Road. It was named after the Hanseatic League, a medieval confederation of merchant guilds that banded together to remove restrictions on trade. It stretched from the Netherlands all the way to Russia. With its orange merchant ship logo, the dark web Hansa hoped to be a modern digital free trade haven. Hansa was home to tens of thousands of listings for all sorts of illegal narcotics, including fentanyl, cocaine, and heroin, as well as counterfeit and fraud-related goods. The Hansa investigation was called Operation Gravesack, and the lead investigating officer was Superintendent Petra Hondrikman. She was a 20-year veteran of the Dutch National Police Agency and had recently been promoted to the top spot in the NHTCU. Hondrikman and her team understood how difficult this game was. 
If you shut down one dark web marketplace, several more would pop up in its place, like cutting off the head of a hydra, or as one of her officers described it as, a whack-a-mole effect. The investigation into Hansa started with a tip, most likely from a private cybersecurity firm called Bitdefender. Officially, the source of the tip is classified, but Bitdefender has claimed some involvement in the case. A researcher at Probably Bitdefender discovered that the development site for Hansa was exposed online. The development site was where admins could test out new features before making it live. Somehow, the dev site's IP address had wound up on the surface web. The NHRCU contacted the dev site's Netherlands ISP and installed software that allowed them to monitor it. Soon, they discovered it was connected to a Tor server running the live Hansa site, their holy grail. It was also connected to two servers in Germany. They made copies of all three. It was a bold move, maybe too bold. Soon, Hansa switched IP addresses and slipped away into the digital ether. Hondrikman figured that the Hansa admins must have noticed someone copying their servers and split. Whatever the cause, it was a setback. But the Dutch National Police still had three copied servers and everything on them. Fortunately for them, one of the German servers included lengthy chat logs between Hansa's alleged co-founders. The chat logs even included the site's admin's home shipping addresses. One was a 30-year-old in Siegen, and the other was a 31-year-old from Cologne. Since their trials are ongoing, their names haven't yet been disclosed to the media. Hondrikman contacted German police and learned that two Hansa admins were already known to them for running another dark web marketplace, lol.to, which specialized in pirated ebooks and audiobooks. She had enough to arrest the German admins right then and there. But like the FBI, the NHTCU was evolving its tactics to fight dark web trafficking. Simply shutting down Hansa wouldn't be enough. She wanted to make users feel unsafe buying drugs online. The plan was bold. If they could somehow take control of Hansa without the site's users realizing it, they could document thousands of drug deals. That could lead to dozens, even hundreds of arrests. But first, she needed to find Hansa's new server. Superintendent Hondrikman and her team studied the German administrator's cryptocurrency purchases. Many cryptocurrency purchases are documented by something called the blockchain. It creates a digital record of when and where cryptocurrency changes hands. If a cryptocurrency owner wasn't careful, these transactions could be linked to their public profiles. They discovered a Bitcoin transaction that matched one of the addresses in the German admin's chat logs. By using blockchain analysis software, they discovered that the payment was made via a Bitcoin provider in the Netherlands. They contacted the provider and learned that the transaction ended up on a server in Lithuania. For the second time, they located Hansa's elusive server. It was around this time that the Dutch learned about Operation Bayonet. Not only did they have everything they needed to take over Hansa, they knew that the Alphabet shutdown would send its 40,000 dealers and 200,000 customers headed their way. Alexandra's arrest was scheduled for July 5th, just weeks away. Hondrikman would have to act fast to take over Hansa before Alphabet went down. They flew to Lithuania, now the third country involved in the Hansa operation. They knew that once the German admins were arrested, it was only a matter of time before Hansa would disappear again, unless they could act. They'd have to migrate the Hansa server from its current location to another one under their control without anyone noticing. On June 20, 2017, Superintendent Hondrikman arrived at the Lithuanian server company, where they set up a base of operations. Over 1.5 thousand kilometers away, German authorities would be making their arrests in Siegen and Cologne. The teams had to assemble at the same time and make the arrests simultaneously. Only then could Hondrikman begin the server migration. If the arrest went wrong, it was entirely possible that the German admins could erase the site or alert its users. If they failed, Hansa would slip away again. From the server company, Hondrikman was on a three-way call with authorities in Siegen and Cologne. German police in both cities gathered around the two admins' apartments. They waited for the signal. The German commander then gave the go-ahead. Hondrikman heard two sets of doors crashed in and tons of shouting in German. 
the Germans took the Hansa admins into custody. So far as Hondrikman could tell, the admins hadn't alerted anyone on Hansa that they were made. In another stroke of luck, their hard drives were unencrypted. In Lithuania, it was go time. The computer engineers migrated Hansa's servers to the Netherlands. Hondrikman prayed that the Hansa admins weren't currently torching their hard drives. They watched the progress bar slowly tick towards completion. The migration took three days. Under police questioning, the Hansa admins gave up their credentials to their accounts, including chat logs for a peer-to-peer -peer messaging system with the site's four moderators. The NHTCU now had control of Hansa, just in time for the FBI and the Royal Thai Police to bust Alexandra Kazes and shut down Alpha Bay. Two weeks later, on July 4th, D Snake, Alpha Bay's head of security, logged onto his computer and tried to log into the site, but it was gone. What the fuck? D Snake logged onto Reddit's main dark web subreddit, which at that point still existed, and read the chatter. People were understandably freaking out. Alpha Bay had vanished, and along with it, millions of dollars worth of cryptocurrency. There'd been no word from the site's admins. It looked like a classic exit scam, like the ones that ended the other post-Silk Road dark web marketplaces. It looked like the site's admins suddenly shut down the site and absconded with everyone's money. D Snake wasn't exactly sure about that. He knew Alexandra Kazes and knew that his ambition was much bigger than an exit scam. Alexandra wanted to build the eBay of dark web drugs. It said so on Alphabay's FAQ page. The snake sensed that Alexandra had gotten busted and the exit scam was a setup. He was right. Like the Dutch National Police, the FBI wanted to strike a psychological blow and make dark web drug buyers and sellers feel like there was no such thing as a safe online drug deal. But for now, the snake knew that he had to leave Alpha Bay behind and disappear. By taking down Alpha Bay, Operation Bayonet had whacked the biggest mole on the dark web. The second biggest, Hansa, was now scurrying towards a trap set by Dutch police. But the Dutch had no idea how big things were about to get. It was eight days after the arrest of Alexandra Kazes in Thailand. He was in custody at the Narcotics Suppression Bureau, an imposing white and tan marble building in suburban Bangkok surrounded by a high fence. Alexandra was an unusual prisoner for the NSB, a Canadian citizen who was being prosecuted in California. Alexandra had been in frequent contact with his Fresno-based lawyer. Alexandra had agreed to be extradited to the United States to face prosecution. There, he would enter a not guilty plea. The plan was for Alexandra's lawyer to argue that Alexandra himself wasn't responsible for what was sold on the site. He didn't sell drugs or contraband himself, he just earned a commission on sales. They were optimistic that this defense would sway the judge. On the morning of June 13th, a humid day in the low 90s, a guard at Thailand's Narcotics Suppression Bureau headed towards Alexandra's cell to take him to his court appearance. For the last several days, the guard's main job was ferrying Alexandra between his cell and the phone bank. Overall, Alexandra had been in good spirits, cheerful even, definitely not acting like someone who was facing life behind bars. But today, when the guard arrived at the cell, he found Alexandra lying on the floor with a towel wrapped around his neck. He appeared unconscious. The guard opened the cell door and rushed over to Alexandra. Mr. Kazes, are you okay? No response. Get a doctor! The guard yelled. Down the hallway, more guards scrambled towards the phone. The guard checked Alexandra's pulse and found none. He flipped him over and began performing CPR, delivering chest compressions and rescue breaths. Finally, the EMTs arrived, put Alexandra on a stretcher, and took him to the infirmary. But he was dead. Suicide. With Alexandra dead, the FBI and the Royal Thai Police lost their main link to the Alpha Bay community and all the information he might have possessed. But Alexandra made yet another security lapse. At his Tui Watana villa, investigators discovered that Alexandra also hadn't encrypted his laptop and was still logged into his admin account on Alpha Bay. They also discovered documents listing all of his assets. Overall, he was worth $23 million, including $8 million in cryptocurrency. 
When it was taken down, he had 250,000 listings for drugs and toxic chemicals, and 100,000 listings for stolen and fraudulent identification documents, counterfeit goods, malware and other computer hacking tools, firearms and fraudulent services. The site was home to 40,000 dealers and 200,000 buyers. Handrakman and her team began referring to them as Alpha Bay refugees. They needed a home and quickly gravitated towards Hansa. In the Netherlands, Superintendent Petra Handrakman and her team were ready. Since migrating Hansa's server from Lithuania to the Netherlands, they'd created a duplicate version of the site, then deleted the original. From their four-story brick headquarters building in Utrecht, near one of the city's famous canals, Hondrukman and her team controlled Hansa. But now, they had a different job, running it. To the officers in the NHTCU, it wasn't strange to be running Hansa and facilitating thousands of drug deals. They rationalized that if they weren't running Hansa, the drugs would be sold on some other site. Just like in the U.S., in the Netherlands, it was perfectly acceptable for cops to buy drugs from a dealer and then arrest the dealer for selling them said drugs. This is a common law enforcement tactic on the dark web. In 2016, Elizabeth Nolan Brown estimated that half of all child pornography sites were run by law enforcement. Running Hansa was also a handy way to keep track of who was buying drugs. During that summer in 2017, the Dutch police captured thousands of addresses belonging to both dealers and buyers. They regularly began knocking on buyers' doors just to let them know they were onto them. The NHTCU had spent months preparing to take over Hansa. They studied the German admin's chat logs and felt confident they could imitate them in this online undercover operation. Hondrikman's team felt they were so well-versed in the admin's personalities that they impersonated them around the clock in shifts. They began by contacting the site's four moderators, who at this point were still unaware that the site was being run by cops. They convinced the moderators that the impending arrival of Alpha Bay refugees was a good opportunity to tweak some of the site's rules and educate their new users on the way things work. They'd enforce the bans on child pornography and firearm sales. One of Hansa's mods approached them about banning the sale of fentanyl, the dangerous synthetic opioid responsible for uncountable overdoses and deaths. Hondrikman was all too happy to oblige. Next, there was the issue of how to accommodate the new Alpha Bay refugees. At this point, there were around 5,000 new requests for membership a day. The site actually had the bandwidth for this uptick, but Hondrikman and her team didn't. The sheer volume of transactions from Hansa's new users were too much to keep up with. They couldn't simply open the floodgates to thousands of transactions daily. Instead, they shut down membership registration for 10 days. This way, they could examine transactions looking for patterns. If a lot of orders were coming from a particular location, there was a good chance a high-level dealer was on site. Hondrikman and her team of investigators and digital forensic experts began recording Hansa's drug deals. On Reddit, the wayward Alpha Bay refugees griped about the bottleneck. One Redditor even offered to sell their Hansa account for 40 bucks. During the 10-day hiatus, Hondrikman and her team made several modifications to Hansa's code to help them better track its users. They unencrypted Hansa users' passwords and began storing them. They also unencrypted Hansa users' PGP keys. PGP stands for Pretty Good Privacy. It's a digital encryption service where users have unique keys they must exchange in order to communicate. Unencrypting the PGP keys allowed them to record Hansa dealers' and buyers' private messages, which might include home addresses, shipping information, and even their real names. Hondrikman's officers came up with ways to trick Hansa users into identifying themselves. Before Dutch police took over the site, Hansa had a feature that automatically scrubbed metadata from images uploaded to the site. This let users post photos of their wares, just like on eBay. They removed that feature. Then, they staged a fake server glitch that wiped everyone's photos from the site. They sent out an email prompting everyone to re-upload their photos, metadata intact. But the most brazen trick Hondrikman's team pulled off was also the most devious. Many Alpha Bay users were still frustrated that they lost the Bitcoin they'd had in escrow, and they feared that Hansa admins might pull a similar exit scam. Hondrikman's officers created a harmless-looking Excel document and sent it to all of Hansa's members, 
In case the site went dark, they claimed, the XL dock contained a key that would allow them to recover their lost Bitcoin up to 90 days later. In fact, the XL document contained a homing beacon that revealed the Hansa user's IP address through its Tor encryption. 64 Hansa users fell for that trick. When they weren't tweaking Hansa's code to entrap its users, the Dutch cops actually had to run Hansa's business operations. While sites like the Silk Road, Alpha Bay, and Hansa aspired to be the Amazons and Ebays of the dark web, in reality, their transactions were far less secure. Soon, they found themselves running Hansa's customer service department, resolving disputes between dealers and sellers. Not wanting to give the Hansa community any reason to be unhappy with Hansa, and thus bring more attention to themselves, they made sure to be prompt, responsive, and fair. It was much better customer service than the Hansa users were used to, and they showed their appreciation on Reddit, Twitter, and message boards. But eventually, things had to come to an end. 27 days after they first took over Hansa, they shut the site down. In that time, they'd overseen a total of 27,000 transactions. This netted them an estimated 10,000 addresses involved in criminal operations. The information they'd gathered would mean years of prosecutions, maybe even enough to make a dent in the online drug trade. When Hansa's users logged onto the site that day, they were unable to log into their accounts and access the cryptocurrency in their Bitcoin accounts. They found a message in big, bold font. This site has been seized and controlled since June 20th. Below that, the Dutch National Police identified themselves, along with the Germans, the Lithuanians, the FBI, and Europol. The message continued. We trace people who are active at dark markets and offer illicit services. Are you one of them? Then you have our attention. They'd even updated Hans's logo, adding insult to injury. Now, the orange merchant ship was keeling over onto its side, sinking under the water. In the weeks following the seizure of Alpha Bay and Alexandra's suicide, the FBI and the Justice Department took a victory lap. In a press conference on June 20th, Attorney General Jeff Sessions called it one of the most important cases of the year. As the biggest dark web marketplace at the time, Alpha Bay was doing between $600,000 and $800,000 a day. Operation Bayonet shut down its operations and seized millions of dollars in Bitcoin. The Alpha Bay shutdown led to several arrests of both dealers and site employees for years afterwards. In September 2020, Brian Connor Harrell, an Alpha Bay admin who went by the names Bota and Pennismith, was sentenced to 11 years in prison for his work on the site. A PR representative received three years. In 2021, Ohio native Larry Harmon pled guilty to federal charges related to his cryptocurrency laundering service, which helped Alpha Bay users move $300 million in Bitcoin. Alexandra Kaz's wife Sunita didn't escape punishment either. Prosecutors suspected her of running the site along with Alexandra and charged her with money laundering in 2017. In the Netherlands, Dutch police shut down Hansa and arrested dozens of dealers and buyers. Many of their criminal cases are still ongoing. Their investigation has also created leads for arrests in several other countries. But did the shutdowns of Alpha Bay and Hansa actually make a difference in the dark web drug trade? University of Manchester criminology professor Patrick Shortis estimates that it took the market about a month to recover. Just like the Dutch police predicted, buyers and sellers moved on to other websites. The whack-a-mole effect was real. If anything, Operation Bayonet and Operation Gravesack taught the next dark web entrepreneurs valuable lessons about operational security and best business practices. In August of 2019, White House Market launched. White House was a reference to Breaking Bad's Walter White. Inspired by Hansa's good customer service while it was under police control, White House Market offered similarly dependable support. It also switched the means of exchange exclusively to Monero, a cryptocurrency supposedly more secure than Bitcoin. White House Market was the main dark web marketplace until October 2021, when users voluntarily shut it down. The site's admin, Mr. White, explained that the founders had met their goals. But some speculated that they wanted to avoid prosecution. 
And what rose up to take White House Market's place? None other than Alphabay. In December 2021, Alphabay's former head of security, D Snake, approached Wired and gave an exclusive interview. They didn't identify themselves, but they did provide DSnake's personal PGP encryption code as proof that it was really them. DSnake was bringing Alphabay back. The site launched that month, offering more protection and encryption than White House Market had. DSnake had learned from Alexandra's mistake and was keeping his laptop encrypted. When he had to leave it unattended, he always logged out, even when he went to the bathroom. In the interview, the snake said there was no such thing as overkill when it came to online security. With the resurrected Alphabay, he offered what every other drug web marketplace couldn't, a safe place where dealers could sell anonymously. But D-Snake's motives weren't just financial, he wanted payback. D-Snake had seen how much the FBI gloated. Special Agent Pheripides played Alexandra's arrest video at a conference at Fordham University, providing mocking commentary much to the audience's delight. Of course, it's also possible that the snake is cooperating with police. It's also possible that police are impersonating the snake for an elaborate honeypot operation to once again trick users to giving themselves up. On the internet, you just never know. I'm Keith Corneluk, and you're listening to Modem Mischief. Thanks for listening to Modem Mischief. Don't forget to hit that follow button in your favorite podcast app right now so you don't miss an episode. This show is an independent production and is wholly supported by you, our listeners. And the best way to support the show is to share it. Tell your friends, your enemies, link to the show in your next darknet drug deal. And another way to support the show is on Patreon. For as little as five bucks a month, you'll receive an ad-free version of the show, plus monthly bonus episodes exclusive to subscribers. Modem Mischief is brought to you by Mad Dragon Productions and is created, produced, and hosted by me, Keith Corneluk. This episode is written and researched by Jim Rowley, edited, mixed, and mastered by Greg Bernhard, aka Alpha Bear 69. The theme song You Are Digital is composed by Computer Bandit. Sources for this episode are available on our website at modemmischief.com. And don't forget to follow us on social media at modemmischief and slide into our DMs, but no dick pics. Thanks for listening. <laughs>